in Africa, we find that among, uh, we heard uh, Ambassador Samasekara yesterday talking about this, but we find that most African countries have not Africanized uh, their uh, language education delivery. But Ethiopia is one that ha has. Article 12 of its constitution, after great agitation during the late 80s and 1990s around civil rights and language rights, has established local councils very similar to the uh, uh, education delivery in Papua New Guinea, but much more wide-ranging, called the Kilil, 14 of these, which are numbered administrative regions with semi-autonomous sub-regions which deliver language in, uh, education in local languages. This is both spoken and written language rights as distinct from what's happening in Papua New Guinea. Ethiopia's case is rare, if not unique, in the extent of intranational and subnational African affairs conducted within traditional African languages. And while for some transnational groups they are not easily accommodated and they are still agitating for rights, the existing Kilil structure does meet the needs of many of uh, Ethiopia's indigenous communities. I'm going to finish in just a few minutes. What I want to just say is that we can find positive examples of multilingual incorporation in language plans and policies in all parts of the world. We can find many more unsuccessful ones as well. But we only need some successful ones to show us what's possible, and we have many successful ones. One of the things that, often, that is often said about language rights and minority rights and multilingualism is that the internet and multimedia it, uh, communication in general disfavor traditional languages and therefore will yield an anglophone world. In fact, I think as we heard yesterday powerfully from some speakers and uh, perhaps a bit later today as well, the internet and speech recognition software in particular suggest some radically different modes of linguistic community production into the future. I think that this will reverse the historically diversity destroying practices of national assimilation policies because it's very difficult for states to control the private language activities of communities who are able to link across tr um, uh, boundaries. One of the best ways this is happening we can call VIVO, voice in, voice out. Speech-based methods for storing, retrieving and communicating information are proliferating. This is very important in tone languages like Vietnamese and Chinese, which have traditionally found, and, and, and uh, non-Latin script languages, which is tra have traditionally found keyboards extremely disadvantaging. What we find with this is that the privileging of listening and speaking over reading and writing is actually restoring one of the key modalities of human sociality, which is oral culture. And this helps to sustain small and diverse and dispersed communities. The greatest users of these are dispersed Australian Aboriginal communities who are able to connect with each other across great distances without any need for literacy. This is using the ears for listening and the eyes for looking at images and interpreting in a way that mirrors traditional forms of communication. After all, Written language and printed texts are technologies late in the evolution of human civilization. And in Australia, we had 60,000 years, possibly, of stable language diversity without written literacy. There is no reason to assume that languages in the future will have to rely on literacy to the same extent as they have in the past, in the recent past. What this means, I think, is that we have a new pattern of the relationship between globalization and multilingualism which is emerging. Quickly, I just want to say that it has been the national state, the idea of a homogenous, autonomous, unilingual national state that has been the cause of the, fund, of the enormous loss of languages that we have seen in the last 55 to 100 years, perhaps 200 years. And a lot of the developments in technology and the lowered sovereignty of globalization actually return the world to the conditions that are more like the pre-national state. This is a unique state of affairs. In the pre-national state, leaders only wanted their people to pay taxes and make no trouble. They didn't want to be culturally similar to them. The elites of Europe were married across the royal families and they spoke the elite languages of Europe, the, French, the Russian royal family speaking in French, the English in German, 
they were not interested in uh, bonding with the populations whose destinies they controlled. This meant that Europe had, at the time, 20% of the world's linguistic diversity and today only has 3% because the national state, which the Europeans invented with ideas like Herder's idea about languages being fundamental to identity and the Jacobins with the idea that monolingualism is essential for republican equality, produced the destruction of indigenous languages in Europe and then exported this model through colonialism to the rest of the world. Today we have the beginnings of a post-national state. I don't predict the decline or disappearance of the national state. I think that's unlikely to happen. But we have a decline there, or a lowered sovereignty, or the ability for people to link across transnational borders in a way that is unique historically. This means that all societies will have to deal with difference. They will have to deal with difference and diversity in all situations in the world, administratively, educationally, in health and in legal affairs and in citizenship, because it's inevitable. Declines in fertility rate have produced Japan and Korea, to historically, traditionally monolingual countries, to recruit immigrants. And now they host speakers of Spanish and Portuguese in Nagoya, of Filipino language. about a family discussing the education of their five-year-old boy in Greater Southall in London um, needed to decide which kind of extra literacy this little boy would have because the school would only give him Latinized English and he was actually considered preliterate in his school education context even though his family were divided across the great North uh, uh, Indian Pakistani Punjabi border in which they were debating whether he would be taught Punjabi using the Gurmurki script, which was uh, invoking identities of Sikhs, or whether he would be inducted into Hindi using Devanagari script, which is associated with Hindus, or whether Urdu in Perso-Arabic script suggesting an Islamic identity. This is the kind of sophisticated home discussion which was going on outside the system that said it was impossible to deal for his uh, literacy because it would only be delivered in English. This boy, much more literate than most of his teachers, was considered pre-literate. We have to therefore replace the impossibilism with a possibilism. A possibilism which says that successful multilingual planning just requires a change of mentality. We should commence not with impossible assumptions but with acceptance that it's inevitable and an essential part of humanness, this diversity, and that language policies for multilingualism are created through political will, not technical skill. You can't go to a university and get someone to teach you how to write a sophisticated language policy. You just have to want to do it. And first, we must replace the impossibilizing talk in education, citizenship, and social relations with an acceptance that this diversity is not only permanent, it's growing. It involves multilingualism, but also multiscriptism. It is possible. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm fascinated, but also concerned about the uh, suggestion of a minor role for written language in the future, as if we didn't have enough concern about job loss. Now you're putting me out of a job. Um, but that's all right. For the greater good, I will accept.